Hello guys, you welcome back to my channel, Form with Physics. In today's lesson, I'm going to explain an introduction to space physics. And at the end of the lesson, you should be able to tell the course of day and night and of the different seasons that we have. And you should be able to differentiate between equinox and solstice. And you should be able to tell a few facts about the moon and the physics of the moon. And then explain what light year is. As a starter, how many of these questions can you answer? Why does the sun appear to move across the sky? What causes night and day? Why do we have different seasons? These are the questions that we'll answer in the course of this lesson. Now, we are used to the sun rising every morning and setting every evening. The sun is not moving. We are the one moving. Now, if you look at this globe, you will notice that it spins about an axis, or its axis. An axis is an imaginary line that runs from the North Pole to the South Pole. If it's not there, you can't see it anywhere or touch it. It's just there to tell us that this is the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, notice that the spin is counterclockwise from the west to the east. Another thing you need to you will notice is that the axis is slightly tilted from a vertical line at about this angle. Okay, it means that the earth, north, and south pole is tilted. Now, because the earth spins anticlockwisely, the sun appeared to rise from the east. And set in the west. It takes 24 hours or one day for one complete spin of the earth around its axis. Okay? So if I have a point, let's say this point at this location here, it will take 24 hours for the earth to move around to rotate this point to rotate and return back to its previous location okay now aside the spinning or the rotation of the earth the earth also revolve around the sun okay the path taken as it revolves is called the orbit now this revolution around the sun takes an approximate approximately 365 days which is the same thing as one year okay now the part of the earth around the sun is not quite circular but elliptical now at some point in the orbit the earth will be close to the sun and at some point it will be very far from the sun now, we should know that it's the gravity of the sun that keeps the Earth in place, that keeps it rotating round and round the orbit. As the Earth spins around its axis and orbit around the sun, the different parts of it, different parts of it receive light from the sun. This causes night and day. I've already explained this earlier. The part that is lit up, that is lit up, is the part that experience the day, while the other part that is dark experience the night time as the earth revolves or, or rotates around its axis. Now the earth is divided into two parts. The northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. These two parts are separated by an imaginary line called the equator. Now, we are going to see shortly that this tilt or this slight bending of the earth is the cause of the different seasons that we have. Now, let's take the North Pole here as a reference point, okay, or the Northern Hemisphere as a reference point. Now, notice that at this stage, 
the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun and receive more of the sunlight or solar energy than the southern hemisphere okay now because of that the northern hemisphere will be in summer this side will be in summer okay why the southern hemisphere will be in winter because it doesn't receive as much solar energy as a knot. Now, in the first quarter of the revolution, the two parts, the north and the south, will receive equal amount of solar energy. Okay? Now, note that this part is in winter, and because it's in winter, when it gets to this stage, the sunlight will help to melt the snow making it to be in spring okay so this part the southern hemisphere will be in spring while the north will be in autumn okay so as, as it spins to the next uh, phase to the next quarter the south will be facing the sun receiving more of the solar energy than the north, northern hemisphere okay so at this stage the south will be in summer while the north will be in winter okay now as it spins to the last quarter both receives equal sunlight but the sunlight will be important to melt the ice here so we'll have spring here and then we'll have our autumn here Okay, at the southern hemisphere. Okay, so we can see clearly that the tilting of the earth is responsible for the different seasons that we have. Now, the beginning of each season is marked by four periods two equinoxes and two solstices now we have a summer equinox here a uh, uh, summer solstice here and we have a winter solstice here and the same thing applies to the northern hemisphere here where we have the vernal equinox or the spring equinox and then at this stage we have the autumnal equinox okay that means we have every uh, part of the sphere the north or the south will experience two equinoxes and two sources throughout the year. Now, what then is equinox? Equinox occur when the sun is directly facing, is directly above the equator, the equator of the earth. It occur whenever the northern and southern hemisphere get as much uh, get equal sunlight okay or equal solar energy and this is marked with equal day and night in both hemisphere the word equinox comes from the latin equinoxia meaning the time of equal days and night the two equinox marks the onset of the spring that is the vernal or March equinox and then the autumnal or September equinox at the northern hemisphere okay what is sources now sources is one of the two times of the year when the position of the tit of the earth relative to the sun result to the most amount of daylight time or the least amount of daylight time okay for the summer sources the sun is directly above this point which is known as the, uh, the tropic of Ca uh, cancer and for the winter sources the sun is directly above this point which is known as the Tropic of Capricorn. Now, 
at this point time of the year we have the what is what is what we is known as the highest tilt you can possibly get okay of the earth towards the sun so for that reason we have more daylight time here or more daytime here and less less night time for the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere we have the least daylight time but more night time okay so this is what we call longer day and shorter night for short or shorter night in the southern hemisphere uh, shorter day in the southern hemisphere and longer night technically speaking solstice is the exact moment in the year when the north pole tilts closest to the sun from the equator now solstice are traditionally considered to mark the start of summer and winter This implies that the season begins with each sources depend on which hemisphere you are. If you are in the northern hemisphere, you get to experience the summer sources, which occur in June. And if you are in the southern hemisphere, you get to experience the winter sources. So we can see this one take place roughly by June 21st. To 22nd while this occur by December to the 1st to 22nd sources can be used in a broader sense to mean a time of the year where we have ever the most sunlight of the year or longer day and shorter night that is summer sources or the least sunlight of the year that is shorter day and longer night that is winter sources for any up any place other than other than the equator the term june sources and december sources refer to the moons in which they take place every year now where does this, the word sources come from it's actually from a latin word solstitium which comes from the past soul meaning the sun and sister to mean stand still so when you combine them literally it means the sun stand still the phases of the moon and the moon now there are a few facts you need to know about the moon like the earth that orbits the sun the moon also orbits the earth okay now another fact is that the moon appear to be bright not because it's luminous but it reflects the light from the sun the moon actually does not give out its own light the moon is our own natural light and have about takes about um, roughly uh, 40,000 kilometer distance for us to get there if you're traveling it revolves on its own axis in one month that is about 27.3 days so we get to see only one part of it and the other part which is the dark side cannot is not visible to us because of uh, the length of its uh, uh, rotation about its axis we see the moon by the reflected sunlight okay i've mentioned that earlier now it does not have an atmosphere and it has a gravity that is one sixth of the gravity that we have here i mean the strength of the gravitational field so if the strength of our gravitational field is about 10 or 9.8 newton per kilogram for one kilogram mass then on the moon we are we're expected to have like 1.67 newton per kilogram thereabout 
So astronauts who walk on the moon move in a springy fashion. But they don't fly into, fly into space because the gravity is enough to keep them in place. Now the moon has different phases. Now this phases is marked by the location, the position of the shadow of the earth cast on it and the parts that are lit up. Okay? Now for the first phase, the earth, the moon is actually covered by the earth shadow, so we don't get to see it. The next phase is what we call the crescent moon or the waxing crescent. Notice that the shadow of the earth is towards the left hand side. Can you see it? The shadow of the earth side that is cast on the left. Now the next phase, which is the first quarter, is where we get to see the half moon. And then the next phase, the gibbous stage, but waxing. Then the one, the next one, the full stage, the full moon, where all of the moon is lit up, reflects the light. No part is obstructed by the shadow of the earth. And then the next phase is the waning, where it gets to go back, recede back to the new moon stage. So at this stage, the shadow of the earth is cast at the right hand side of the moon. Okay, so that's waning stage. Now the next stage is the, uh, the third quarter, we can also call it the last quarter. And then we have the waning crescent and then the new moon. Okay, the, the process goes on and on like that throughout 27 days or 27.3 days. Now the earth, the sun and the moon in orbit. Now this is a uh, 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 um, self-explanatory from what we can see that the moon rotates about the earth and the earth rotates go around the sun now how long does it take the earth the light from the sun to reach the earth now light we know travel at a very very fast speed it travels at approximately 300,000 uh, kilometer per second and for the fact that you travel this fast we use it to quantify a lot of space distances the space distances are very very enormous they are very large okay for instance the spacecraft called the Newton the new Voyager that was uh, that passed Pluto in 2015 was actually released in 2006 and that's why being the fastest very cool the earth has ever released in space it took it over nine years to reach pluto so you can imagine the distance how large the distance is okay now it takes light about 5000 seconds to get to us from the sun now, because it takes light 5,000 seconds, we can say that uh, the sun is five, sorry, 500 seconds to get to us from the sun. Because it takes 500 seconds, we can say that the sun is 500 light seconds away from us. Okay? Now, note that one light second is equivalent to 300,000 kilometers. That's the distance they can be covered by light in one second okay now let's see other um, some of the distance used in astronomy we have one astronomical unit AU which is the distance between the earth and the sun and one light seconds which I explained earlier as a distance traveled by light in one second which is equivalent to 300,000 kilometer per kilometer Okay, kilometers or 300 million meters, as the case may be. Now we have a question here where we're expected to determine the distance of the sun, the distance of the earth from the sun, considering the fact that light travels 500 seconds from the sun to the earth. Okay, so all we need to do is to plug in the values in this formula, speed distance over time. 
we have the speed of the of light to be 300,000 km per second or 300 million meter per second multiplied by the time it takes which is 500 seconds and that will give us 150,000 150 million kilometer okay in kilometer or 150 billion meter in meters okay considering that fact what then is light years a light year is the distance the light can travel in one year light moves at this speed 300,000 km per second so in one year it can travel at approximately 9.5 trillion kilometer okay now once you can determine that by plugging in the values for the time in this formula okay the time that is 365 times 3600 times 24 times the speed of light which is 36 uh, which is um, 300,000 km per second okay plug it in and determine the distance okay so one light year is equivalent to this 9.5 trillion kilometer the Milky Way galaxy is about 150,000 light year across think of quantifying this or explaining in terms of distance it will be too large the Andromeda galaxy is 2.3 million light year away from us okay so light year is um, very important to in estimating uh, distance between two suns distance between the earth and another sun that is far that is not in our solar system and so on and so forth okay now earth to moon we have about 1.2 light seconds that means it takes 1.29 seconds for light traveling from the air to get to the moon air to sun eight light minutes uh, which is roughly 500 light seconds okay it takes light from the sun to travel eight minutes to get to the earth and so on now the orbital speed now, if an object travel in roughly circular paths, we can say that the circumference described by the object is 2 pi r, where r is the radius, orbital radius. And um, the speed is the distance over time, which is the circumference over the time. And the time is a period for one complete orbit or one complete rotation or revolution, as the case may be. Okay? Now, we need to know that speed for an object describing a circle is constant, but the velocity is changing. Now, notice that the velocity of this object is tangential. It's towards this direction. Now, for the fact that velocity keeps changing, we can see acceleration also. It has a resultant acceleration. Okay? Now, remember from Newton's second law that for an object to accelerate, there, there is the, uh, a possibility that a resultant force must have acted on it. And the resultant force in this case for an object moving around a circle is the centripetal force. Okay, All of these have been explained in a lesson, the previous lesson, um, in circular motion. Okay, We can determine the orbital um, speed of the moon using that relation. 2 pi r over t okay where t is the time taken for the moon to move around the earth in seconds okay if it takes 27 days and the radius between of the moon from the earth center is 380,000 kilometer we can convert this time to seconds by multiplying by 24 for one day times 60 times 60 which gives us this now plug in our value and the radius is this plug in the value in this equation in this relation and we get 1.023 kilometer per second now different planets have different orbital speeds for instance mercury 
describes move around the sun at 47.87 km per second, the Earth 29.78 km per second, while Neptune 5.4 5.43 km per second. Now what, what did you notice about the orbital speed of the planet in relation to the uh, to their distance from the sun? Did you notice any pattern? If yes, please comment on the comment section below, okay? And um, before I wrap it up, I would like to acknowledge I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the sites where I got those pictures from and some of the people that put the PowerPoint in place, like Miss H. And um, I would like to thank you for going through the video and please don't forget to leave a comment tell me what i'm not doing right so that i can adjust thank you and god bless